Good morning, everyone. Welcome here. Uh, a special welcome to you if you're watching online via the video stream. Uh, or if you're watching from Tabor Manor, I hear that the signal to five Tabor, the Evergreen Apartments, has just been fixed. So let's give a hand for Dave and Rick, the maintenance guys who work with David to fix that. If you see them throughout the week, then tell them thank you. Um, there's a couple announcements in the bulletin uh, I just want you to take note of. Next week is our communion and potluck Sunday, so keep that in mind. Uh, time is running out to sign up for the women's tea if you are a woman or a girl, anyone of the female. Uh, I will not be there, but that's going to be great. Tickets are $10, and it's going to be on June 2nd. Um, and we are having a volunteer appreciation barbecue coming up, so if you volunteer anywhere in the church, which I'm going to just clarify is probably most of you, uh, they, there's a list on the website, and if you're unsure if you're a volunteer here, you probably are, okay? <laughs> it includes everything from quilting to kids club to greeting to... Uh, helping make food for people when they have a baby or something. Almost anything. So if you sign up, you can come. There's a sign-up sheet in the back and on the website. Uh, please look at your bulletin for other announcements. And yeah, welcome here. I'm just going to pray to open up the service. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this place and thank you for meeting us here. Um, we, we love you, we, we want to praise you this morning, and we pray that our worship and our community would be uh, a blessing on your, on your ears and your eyes this morning. And I pray that, yeah, that you meet us here and that you go with us this week as we move into the rest of our lives. In your name we pray, amen. Yeah, good morning here this morning. I just pray if you're able to that you, uh, that you stand with us and worship God. Okay. 
Please be seated this morning. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. Your Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is on your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome.
the ushers up here this morning. Yeah, God, I just thank you um, Yeah, for the amazing work you do in this world. I think time to time I can sort of be set back and in wonder, in, in disbelief, but it's it's you. You do the most amazing things. You provide for your children, God, and I just thank you that we're all able to gather here this morning and worship your name. We're here to worship who you are, that you've never failed us, that you've never let us go. And I just pray for the offering this morning. Um, yeah, that people are willing to give freely where they're able to, and that, that all of this can be done for your kingdom. Amen. my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power through Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee.
It's time for Kids Zone, so all the kids can come meet me up here at the front. Did you remember your Bible? Good job. Who else remembered their Bibles today? Anyone? Let's see some Bibles. <laughs> There's a few. All right, a couple. <laughs> That's good. We can work on it. It's okay. We have many more Sundays to go. <laughs> uh, good morning, guys. How are you? Good. We have a nice small group today. It's good. We'll have like good, intimate conversation. Um, there was no family life hour this morning, so that means that we are taking a break from our usual Bible timeline. And I thought it would be nice if we spent a bit of time in prayer together downstairs, because that's such an important part of being a Christian and, and living in Christian community, right, is learning how to pray and actually praying for each other. It's a very encouraging thing to be a part of. So I have a question for you. When I pray, I wonder, have you ever noticed, sometimes I say at the end, in Jesus' name, amen. Anyway, have, have any of you heard me say that? <laughs> Phil has? Emily has. Have you ever heard me say that? Yeah? In, um, in our staff meetings here at church, we've been going through our Mennonite Brethren confession of faith. So the things, it tells us the things that we believe about God and about the Bible. And we were talking a little bit about why we say that in prayer. And it got me thinking, um, do you guys know what that means? Why do you think we say that when we pray? Does anyone want to take a guess? No. Wow, you guys are like super quiet and still today. I don't know how to take it. Okay, so we understand that um, the Bible teaches us that we only have access to God through his son, Jesus, because of what he did on the cross, right? He died on the cross for our sins. And we know that it's the Holy Spirit who enables us or gives us the power to pray, right? He helps us along on our journey as we are growing closer to Christ. And so when we pray, we understand that God is part of a trinity, right? He's God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, and so all, all three of those are active participants when we're praying to him. So when we pray, we pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross with the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? It's just, it's important for us to talk about these things because so often we can get in the habit of saying churchy things or traditions are passed down to us that that will say things that sometimes we don't even know what they mean or why we're saying those things. And so it's important as Christians that we take time to actually sit down and think, wait, what is this in the Bible? Does this make sense? Even things that we do in church too, right? We need to know that, that what we're doing and saying is actually biblical. <laughs> so we are going to go downstairs and we are going to talk a little bit more about prayer and actually spend time praying for each other this morning. So let's pray, and we'll go downstairs. God, thank you for your word. I thank you that you've given us this tool to, to learn more about you and understand you, even the, the things that seem kind of confusing to us. Um, I pray that you will give me wisdom this morning to be able to... Um, teach truthfully about who you are and about what prayer is and, and that I can share my passion for you with these kids this morning and that it will be um, a contagious passion and that these kids will be excited to learn more about you and that they will be excited to talk to you and, and be excited to pray for one another. Um, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. I just pray that you will fill every single room, every inch of this space and, and throughout our city and our country, God, that you will just be moving. 
Yeah. I pray that you will give us each a passion and a zest for your word this morning and, and to learn more about you. And yeah, I, I invite you to be um, a very active participant in what's, what's happening here. And, and not just a participant, but that you will be leading all of our, our words and our service this morning. So we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Just before we go into prayer, I would just like to make a short announcement. It's spring, and many of you might have been cleaning out your homes and your garages, and you might be finding a lot of stuff that you don't need anymore. And you don't want to throw it away because it's still too nice, and you might be thinking, oh, I wish there was a yard sale that I could donate this to. Well, guess what? You're in luck <laughs> because our church is going to be having another community yard sale. Sabrina and the leadership team have decided, I think because there was a demand in our community, that we would do this service for our community. So you need a heads up to collect your stuff and get ready to bring it. You can donate it to the church yard sale tables or you can book your own table and sell it yourself. Or I know there are so many crafty people in this church who are making like these awesome baby blankets or other things. You need to get really busy and make a whole table <laughs> so that you can sell to the community and we can reach out and be friends that way. You'll see more details. I think it is in the bulletin already for the end of the month of June, but you will see more details to come and you might even be asked to get involved or help. And just before uh, we prepare our hearts for prayer, I do want to say one other short thing. As we were singing the song, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, I was reminded of something that happened a long time ago, and I just feel led to share it. I was only 22, and I was in my first teaching position in a grade 2 class, and I was teaching about the real meaning of Easter, uh, because, of course, it's all about Jesus Christ. And a little boy pulled on me and pulled on me and said, Mrs. Plett, you can't say that. That is such a bad word. You see, all he'd ever heard the name Jesus Christ before is when somebody was angry and swearing. And that, to me, it was so sad. And I, and I was able to tell him right away, no, it is not a bad word. It is the best word in the whole world, and it is the best name ever. And I just pray that more and more people in the world will understand that, not to use the Lord's name in vain, but to know it as the best word in the world. Let's bow. Oh, dear Jesus, Messiah, name above all names, we come to you this morning and we honor and we praise and we worship you. We could never even come close to imagining your power, your grace, your love for us. But we want to today thank you for that. Thank you that we can come to this place of freedom and worship you. And that we can worship every day. It doesn't have to be in this house. But every day you are looking for us to um, bond with you, to be your friend, to accept your gracious gifts to us. And I just pray that each one of us here would do that today and every day as we walk through the weeks. Dear Lord, we ask that you would um, continue to meet the needs. First of all, around the world, dear Lord, there are so many needs, whether it's people who are in war or have experienced shootings or volcanoes, dear Lord, there is so much hurt. And you have never promised that we would have a life on this earth without bad things happening to us. But you have promised that you would be with us every step of the way. And we just thank you so much for that amazing, amazing promise. And dear Lord, there are people in our own church family who are hurting um, there are ones listed in our bulletin, and there are others. As we 
look into our bulletin. We want to pray for Josh and Natasha as they serve at camp. We want to pray for the friends and neighbors at Old Pine Trail that, you know, you're being, are being pulled into a relationship with you, and we just ask that you would bless those bridges that are being built and that they would really uh, have eternal fruit. We continue to pray for Peter Longhurst, who's here today, Bob McColgan, and we just pray for their ongoing needs. For Quinn, who is the McColgan's son, we just lift him up. We know the power of prayer, dear Lord. And we just bring that down for these people who need it. We pray for Eva Lowen, who's also here today, and Marta Funk with chronic health struggles. Katerin Clausen and Sarah Weeb, who are confined to their homes. And dear Lord, um, Lucas Hine, a young man in our church, has had surgery this week, and he might have to go back to hospital today. So we just ask that you would put your arms of love around this young man and uh, bring him back to total restoration and health. Thank you that you have worked in the life of Kelly, who is the Schroeder's daughter-in-law, dear Lord. We just continue to lift her up. And dear Lord, we know there are so many other needs. And we just ask that you would meet everyone and that we would learn to come to you for everything small and little because you know the hairs, the number of hairs on our head. You care about every little thing. I uh, continue, or we continue to pray for our leadership in this church. Thank you for Emily Gertz and Rudy Hine and Kelly Dahl, uh, members of our board. Thank you for Paul, who is going to be bringing uh, important words from you this morning. And dear Lord, we just ask you to bless it all. Please, please help our um, humble worship and praise be acceptable to you. And dear Lord, as we go into the week, help us to always remember that you can do way more than we can ever ask or think. And I pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. I'm going to be reading from Exodus 33, verses 12 to 23, if you'd like to follow along. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this, is, that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see my face and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Today is Pentecost Sunday. 
50 days after Easter, one of the high holy days that uh, the Jewish people would celebrate. And I think it's fitting that in our study through the book of Exodus, we come to the place where we see the glory of God that would be fulfilled many, many years later on the day of Pentecost, as we read in Acts chapter 2, where again we see the Spirit of God being poured out. Now, as Israel was journeying from Egypt to the Promised Land, God used this time to teach and instruct them about many things. And uh, there was much that they had to learn about honoring God, about obeying his leading, but they also had to learn how to live with each other. These are things that, uh, there are things that we will learn only when we go through desert times. And you know what I mean by a desert times, those times in your life when you feel like you're in a wilderness, when you feel like you're in a dry place. Well, they had been a nation that had been held in captivity. We've talked about this. Their actions were dictated to them by their taskmasters, but now they were developing a a new identity. Uh, They were developing a new relationship with God. It's like they were a brand new Christian who was learning what it meant to be a Christian, learning what it was like to live in a community of faith, learning what it was like to follow the leadings of the Father. Now, after Moses had received the Ten Commandments from God, and by the way, this set of commands is still today forms the basis for many of the laws of our land, uh, and he delivers them to the people, God continues then to instruct Moses as how his law would unfold. Now, as we see in all parts of the Bible, God will progressively reveal himself to his people. As we're studying through the Gospels, one of the tenets that we have in our studies is that God progresses, Jesus progressively reveals himself, his nature, to his disciples and then by extension to us. He doesn't give it all at once. He progressively gives us little bits and pieces. And they, this will be a nation that he has chosen to be his own. Now we're going to take just a quick look at some of the highlights of some of these chapters because The portion of scripture that I was given this morning is 14 chapters long, okay? So if you want me to read it all, I will. Did you bring your lunch? Okay, we're going to hit some of the highlights of these 14 chapters, and then we're going to end up in the portion that Joan read for us this morning. As we said, some of these are are instructions that are given to Moses for the people, But we're going to see that every one of them is given with the intent of developing them as individuals and as a nation. Now in chapter 20, he gives instructions on how to properly approach God. Now this could be a sermon series all on its own. And think about it. How do we prepare to approach God? How did you prepare for his presence today? When you're getting up this morning, how did you prepare your hearts to receive the worship and give worship, how did you prepare your hearts for the word in his presence? And what does he tell them? He says you need to build an altar, a place where you can offer up to God. Hmm, worship, as we see again, is not all about us. It's all about him. And we come to offer ourselves. Our offering is not just what the ushers collect. Our offering is our worship, a sacrifice of praise, Scripture calls it at times. And I like what was said, may our our worship be acceptable to you. And so there were instructions on how to properly approach God. We read in in Psalm 100, 100, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise, a proper entry into the presence of the king. Then from chapters 21 to 23, he gives rules for getting along with each other. Laying down the ground rules of what will eventually be the second of the two greatest commandments that Jesus keys in in the Gospels. And in the specifics, he is going to say, okay, well, here's what you do. If somebody knocks your tooth out, well, you knock his tooth out. It was called an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was the Old Testament law. 
where you love your neighbor as yourself, or in equal standings. Now, when Jesus comes, he says, this is what you've heard, but I'm going to give you a new commandment. It goes past that. The old commandment was love your neighbor as yourself. The new commandment is love your neighbor, love everyone the way that I loved you. Now, that superseded the old where the old says if you know, your, your neighbor hits you, you hit him back. This one was if your neighbor hits you, love him. You see, Jesus loved us more than he loved himself. He loved us more so that it was not us up on the cross with him. He was on the cross for us. He went above and beyond. Now, these rules, uh, there you'll see a, a code of conduct that every civilization around the world has adopted wherever you go. They have a, a set of rules as to how this community works. And that's what God was doing in teaching them how to live with each other. How to get along with each other and how to make sure that everything went smoothly. But then in chapter 23, and this is all preamble to what I really want to talk to you about this morning. In chapter 23, verses 10 to 13, there's the necessity of a sabbatical rest. It's emphasized. And it's interesting because this is the fourth of the Ten Commandments. God himself patterned this at the creation, and we are created in such a way that one day out of seven, we need to rest from our labors and dedicate that time to rest and refreshing. Now, I think if we're honest with ourselves, this is an area that most of us are very negligent in. An area that we tend to skip over in the busyness of life. Yet we should regard it with as much respect as not killing or not stealing because it was the fourth of the Ten Commandments that God gave. We tend to minimalize it. And so, oh, yeah, well, I should. I should. How many have ever said you should do something and never got it done? Yeah. I think it was uh, Francis of Assisi once says, I can't do all things, but I can do some things. The things I can do, I ought to do, and the things I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. I think we need to revisit the aspect of rest. Why are so many people this day burned out, tired out, emotionally stressed? Because we've not taken time to rest. When they did away with the Sabbath day law where stores were open all the time, that was a great injustice to many, many people. He said, but I can't afford to rest. Friends, if God said it, you can't afford not to. You can't afford not to. And the older I get, the more I appreciate that. I remember what my dad used to say as he got older. He said when he was younger, the thing he hated to do was take a nap. He said now that he was older, and he passed away when he was 80, he said the only thing better than one hour's nap is two hours. <laughs> I'm not there yet, but I'm thinking about it. But then in chapter 23, verses 20 to 33, we see the blessings of obeying God and the promises that he made to prosper and to protect those who obey, God sending his own angel to protect them and to fight for them. Now, I said we're just skipping over this really, really quick. But as you read through it, uh, you're going to, to, I'm sure, as God, by his spirit speaks to you, you're going to be blessed by it. Especially this. From chapters 25 to 30, he goes into great detail to describe the tabernacle and all of its furnishings. He said, oh, wow. This is great. We see descriptions. We see measurements. We see materials. We see purposes all given in great detail. So much so that many readers will just skip over these chapters to get back to the action. Okay, true confession time. 
How many, when you're reading through the scriptures, tend to skip over the genealogies? Okay. How many, when you're reading through the tabernacle, tend to skip over how everything was made? All right, let's lead, read this in detail, all five chapters. No. <laughs> what do we see here? Here's what we see. God is concerned with all the details of what he's doing. He is concerned about the little things. And as such, we can take great comfort in knowing that there is nothing too small or insignificant in our lives that he does not care about. And when I was reading through this, how he said, here's how you have to fashion it. Here's, here's an example. Chapter 26. Uh, he's telling Moses how to make the temple curtains. In verses 2 to 4, he says, All the curtains are to be the same size, 28 cubits long and 4 cubits wide. Join five of the curtains together and do the same with the other five. Make loops of blue material along the edge and, and on the end curtain in one set and do the same with the un, end curtain in the other set. He said, how can you get blessed with that? I can get blessed with that because God is telling him exactly what to do for every situation. And there's nothing that happens in our lives that escapes his view. And everything that happens to us is important to him. Everything. God is in the details. Psalm 139 tells us he even sees our substance. As it was coming together in our mother's womb. And he takes the time to write it down in his book. David says, your thoughts toward me are more in number than the sand. See, you matter to God. You're not an accident. You're not insignificant. You are precious in his sight. And you can come to him with all your cares, all your anxieties, because God has got a plan for your life. And the same God who spelled out the little details on how to make every aspect of this tabernacle, he left nothing in doubt, is able to direct our paths as we read in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He is able to see everything. He knows our anxieties. He knows our stresses. He knows our thoughts. He knows our fears. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, 27 says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And then Jesus goes on in Matthew to further explain the great care the Father has for us. Why? Because God is in the details. Next time you read that, you're going to read it in a different light. Because if God so spells out the little things in building a tabernacle, are you not much more valuable than they? Then in Exodus chapter 31, God even provides two men, Bezalel and Oholiab, with the spirit of wisdom and understanding to be able to craft all the articles that Moses has been shown while he met with God on the mountain. See, it's great to have a set of blueprints, but if you don't have anyone who knows how to read blueprints, you're, you're in trouble. And so God gives these two guys the spirit of wisdom and understanding. He says, this is how you do what I've asked you to do. The hymn goes to say, all I have needed, thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. In all this, then we come to what we do so well. We get impatient. Chapter 32. 
Moses is absent. The people come to Aaron to make them tangible gods of gold, the golden calves. You, I don't need to go into detail. You've heard this story in Sunday school probably a hundred times. What's that tell us? It tells us that we are made to worship. That's how we're made. We're wired that way, but unfortunately there are many today that are directing their worship to things other than the Lord. They have made for themselves gods of many things. They've made gods of ambition, of power, of money, of ease, of pleasure, of family, and so on. See, anything that takes the place that God alone should possess is really an idol in our lives. Then there's still others, as we have alluded to earlier, that have made worship something to gratify themselves instead of giving glory and honor to God. Worship is not about us. It is about God. That's why we should always say, Lord, may our worship be acceptable to you. See, in spite of all that God had done for them, in spite of all the provisions he had made and the carefulness with which he had given them proper instructions as to how to live, they still acted as Isaiah, centuries later, would describe. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And are we any different? Lest we judge them too quickly, we need to examine ourselves. And I'm sure that we will find that We also needed the grace and mercy of God and indeed still do every day. And in chapter 32 and 33, Moses reacts with burning anger for the wickedness of the people and God himself would have wiped them off the face of the earth if Moses had not stood between the most holy God and a sinful nation. And he pleads for them, even as Jesus today pleads for us before the throne of God, as our intercessor. See chapter 32, verse 31, 32. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold, but now please forgive their sin. Dash. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. See, Moses offered himself up. Even as centuries later, Jesus would also offer himself up for the sins of the world. What an amazing picture. And one that we would only grasp the significance of centuries later. Okay, now, this is all preamble because I don't want you to miss what was in those chapters, but here's what we want to really talk about for just a few minutes this morning. Here it is. Chapter 33, we see an earnest plea from the heart of Moses to the heart of God. I want us to focus on this. The Lord speaks to Moses in verse 14 and says, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. He promised his presence. He promised he would not leave them. Moses replies, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. In other words, We don't want to go anywhere without you, Lord. If you're not coming with us, then we don't want to go. Please don't send us if you're not coming. We as a church are on the threshold of some very important decisions. We as a church have a future in front of us that we are earnestly asking God for direction for. And the desire of the search committee, the desire of the the board, the desire of the staff, the desire of the congregations is, God, we need your leading. We need to know your will. 
We say, Lord, we need you. Please don't let us go anywhere or do anything where you won't be with us. Show us where we should go and what we should do. And God grants that request every day through the Bible. Say, Lord, what do you, what's your will? We, we have it in front of us right here. We have the word of God, which is our rule of faith and authority. It's our roadmap to heaven. And we have his precious Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. And today, again, we celebrate Pentecost, which on that day 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit became the abiding presence of God on earth as he was poured out in fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And after such a plea, Moses then asked God for one of the most precious blessings in the whole of Scripture. He says, now show me your glory. He says, God, I really want to know you. Let me see your power. Let me see your majesty. Let me see all that this human mind can comprehend. God, let me see you. Paul the Apostle echoed this plea in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 to 11. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Moses, I can just see him. So, oh God, we've talked. You've, you've given me commands, you've given me instructions, but God, I don't want to know just about you. God, I want to know you. God, show me, show me your glory. Lord, take me to that next level. Here's what God says. I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Moses asked to see the glory, and God says, you want to see the glory? Here it is. Here's what makes up my glory. He says, I'll show you my goodness. Why? Because it's my goodness that is glorious. I will proclaim my name. Why? Because my name is glorious. I appreciated what Lydia said earlier about the name of Jesus being the highest name. And I appreciated the songs that Aaron led us in today talking about the glory of God filling this place. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. He says his mercy, that's part of his glory. His compassion. See, the glory is not just a cloud. His glory is made up of all of these attributes that he has. His, his goodness, his name, his mercy, his compassion. That's what makes God glorious. And that's what he said to Moses. You want to see what glory is? I will show you all of this. All of these together, what makes up the glory of God, it's unique to him alone. Isaiah 42 says, I am the Lord, that's my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. He doesn't give his glory away. Yet in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, we, we read that the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being Sustaining all things by his powerful word. If you ever wanted proof that Jesus was in fact God the Son and the Son of God in flesh, it's right here. Because God does not give his glory to another, yet Jesus is the, the very brightness and the radiance of his glory. The only way that we then are able to participate in this glory of God is when his precious Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. 
And it's his righteousness within us, not ours. His righteousness. He doesn't give it to us. But as we receive Christ into our lives, it radiates through the, right, the righteousness of Christ. That's why the scripture says, Christ in us, the hope of glory. See, Moses cries out to God for him to show him his glory, and he allowed all that is glorious about himself to pass by Moses while he shielded him with his hand as Moses was placed in the cleft of the rock. An old hymn that I grew up with. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and he covers me there with his hand. When we cry out to see the glory of God, what does God say to us today? He says, look at my son. You want to see my glory, you look at my son. For he is the radiance of my glory. Look at Jesus, for everything you want to see in me is reflected through him. Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. In his anger over the sin of Israel, God would would have been just in wiping them off the face of the earth. And in his anger towards all of us who have sinned against his glory, he would be justified in wiping us off the face of the earth. For Israel, Moses temporarily stepped in the gap between God and man. And Jesus finally stepped into the gap between God and man. And God in his mercy and grace has has accepted the sacrifice of his son Jesus as payment for our sins. And we have been declared no longer guilty. He doesn't say we never sin because that would not be right. But he says you are no longer guilty because the penalty has been paid. <clears throat> we have been justified through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. The song says I'm forgiven because he was rejected. I'm accepted. He was condemned. See, the God of the details cares so much about every aspect of your life, and through Jesus, we have access then into the very presence of Almighty God. Well, our passage ends, and uh, Aaron, bring your team back up, if you would, please. Our passage ends with Moses having to carve out another set of tablets. Why? Because in his anger over the sin of Israel... Somebody said Moses was the worst sinner. He broke all Ten Commandments at once. (laughs) He had to carve out another set, and God once again took his finger and wrote his law for them to have, that which occupied the Ark of the Covenant. And again today, he offers his free gift of grace and forgiveness. And again today, he invites us to become part of his family. Today, he is writing his love with his finger on the tablets of your heart. So my question as I leave it with you, are you listening to him? Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Worthy Worthy of every song we could ever sing 
Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. In Jesus, the name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever be. We live for you. We live for you.
from here today.